it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. The slumbering battleship awakens. December 31st, 2019. The Catch 31 restaurant on the Virginia Beach boardwalk. The popular and classy Catch 31 restaurant bar that sat on the corner of Atlantic and Pacific Avenue on the world famous Virginia Beach Strip hosted the most amazing seafood and Kobe beef that you could find on the entire Atlantic Avenue boardwalk. The New Year's Eve was cool. And the salty breeze coming from the Atlantic Ocean was brisk and refreshing as crowds of locals and tourists celebrating the last holiday of the year packed the beachfront and bars. Outside, the large wooden deck attached to the restaurant had a wraparound tiki bar, surrounded by palm trees and strings of tiny lights. The outdoor lounge was adorned with many large circular wooden tables which contained a warm and inviting wood fire set in a pit right in the middle of each table, which illuminated the chilly night with a sultry warm glow. The sound of the Atlantic Ocean, rushing lazily on and off the beach, seemed to play a sleepy melody, which was accompanied by the voices of the partiers and revelers eagerly waiting for the new year. On open-air stages set along small parks which lined the boardwalk every half-block, local bands played jazz, blues and soft rock music to entertain the visitors, as they awaited the start of the fireworks display, which would light up the beach in bursts of bright and lively colours. Virginia Beach was a relatively conservative city, this being a largely military town, mostly navy, and despite the large crowds, no one was getting too loud or boisterous, even as New Year's was only two hours away. At the Catch 31, a petite but very attractive young college co-ed from Lincoln, Nebraska, her light brown hair flowing down her back in a ponytail, stood at the outside bar. She wore a white blouse and a tight-fitting red jacket, which accentuated her pert and ample breasts. The young lady swirled a tall glass of Long Island iced tea in her hand as she listened intently to a pair of tall, skinny young men wearing baseball caps standing on either side of her. A second fresh Long Island iced tea sat on the bar in front of her, bought for her by one of the young men who was wearing the navy blue and orange sweater of the University of Virginia. The other young man, wearing a loose, wide and grey button-down shirt, had ordered three shots of tequila for them. So there I was, the guy wearing the white and grey shirt said. I turned the corner of the concrete wall and saw a set of wooden stairs leading to a second-story landing. I held my auto-rifle bazooka in the ranger tactical operation up and ready firing position, the way I was taught when I went to the elite United States Navy SEAL training school, when suddenly I saw him. There he was. It was Osama bin Laden. He appeared out of a side room and was running across the landing to a door on the other side to escape. Oh, what's an auto-rifle bazooka? said the girl, her speech slightly slurred from the ice libations that the young men were pouring into her. I've never heard of that. The guy wearing the button-down shirt stared uncomfortably at the girl, seemingly searching for words. That's a special, um... That's a special gun thing that only we elite United States Navy SEALs are allowed to use, said the other guy wearing the UVA sweater. The two young men nodded at each other in agreement. Yeah, yeah, so uh, the reason you've never heard of it is only because elite United States Navy SEALs like us use it. Not even the Marines or the Army have it. Anyway, as my partner was going after Bin Laden, he suddenly had his auto-rifle bazooka shot out of his hand by Bin Laden. Osama had one of those uh, KZ-47 automatic assault machine gun rifle things, and he sprayed it at my body here. Oh, um, you mean an AK-47? said the girl, woozily giggling. Uh, yeah, yeah, right, said the guy wearing the button-down shirt, looking annoyed at his friend. His, um, AK-47 gun. Not only had he destroyed my gun, but he also shot me in the shoulder. That's how I got the Purple Heart for outstanding bravery. The college girl from Nebraska gasped, hand covering her mouth, and then rubbed his shoulder. Osama bin Laden shot you? Oh, that's awful. Well, you hurt bad. The guy in the button-down shirt looked triumphantly at his friend. I was fine. We elite United States Navy SEALs are especially trained to ignore pain and continue fighting until we complete the mission. Besides, I 
still have my really long, sharp knife. Oh, you're a bayonet, said the college girl. Yeah, yeah, my bayonet, stammered button-down shirt guy. I pulled it out of my tactical ranger assault special operations bootstrap holster and ran up the stairs after Osama bin Laden who uh, immediately kicked my buddy here in the chest and made him fall backwards down the stairs, interrupted UVA sweater guy, slapping button-down shirt guy on the back. Button-down shirt guy gave his buddy an evil look for interrupting his story. Ignoring his smaller friend, UVA sweater guy quickly passed around the shots of tequila, smiling sweetly as he passed the shot glass to the girl while tauntingly sneering at his buddy. Yeah, so while he was falling back down the stairs, I came around the other corner and sprayed Osama bin Laden on full automatic with my, uh, yeah, my uh, AK-47. Oh yeah, I had the uh, sniper version, because I'm an elite United States Navy SEAL sniper. You two guys are the ones who killed Osama bin Laden? exclaimed the girl loudly and excitedly, her eyes wide and hands clasped. Shh, 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 said UVA sweater guy, holding up his hands and looking nervously around. Not so loud, honey. We elite United States Navy SEALs are ordered to keep a low profile. We don't want people knowing who we are because there are many terrorists lurking around who still want to take revenge on us for eliminating Osama. Yeah, uh, you know, President Obama awarded us each the Medal of Honor for taking out Bin Laden, said Button Down Sweater Guy. But they couldn't show it on TV or anything. The girl nodded solemnly. Wow, she said. I never thought I'd actually meet two real war heroes when I came here to Virginia. Yeah, well, said Button Down Shirt Guy, we don't like to brag. Even around other elite United States Navy SEALs, we don't like to brag because they're definitely jealous of us. My partner and I are like uh, much better than just regular elite United States Navy SEALs. Yeah, super SEALs, said UVA Sweater Guy, putting his arm around the girl's waist and pulling her into him. You know, he said with a sly smile, if you want to talk more elite United States Navy SEAL stuff, we have a room upstairs. We'd be happy to show you our elite United States Navy SEAL big guns, if you know what I mean. The girl looked up at both of the skinny young men. Grinning knowingly, she slowly licked her lips. I looked over at my girlfriend, who only shook her head and rolled her eyes. We'd been standing right next to them at the bar, enjoying a glass of champagne while waiting for our table to be prepared. We walked over the few steps towards the young coed, my girlfriend pushing in between her and UVA sweater guy while I bumped in between the girl and button-down shirt guy. In unison, my girlfriend and I slammed our US military identification cards, called CAC cards, on the bar as I yelled, CAC card check, gentlemen. The two startled young men jumped, looking at me and my girlfriend with a mixture of surprise, annoyance, and uncertainty. I grinned and glanced over at my girlfriend. Oh, she was smirking evilly at the two genuine, all-American, elite, United States Navy SEAL war heroes. Well, gentlemen, she said in a voice dripping with deadly honey. UVA sweater guy puffed up to his full six-foot-two-inch tall, 130-pound self, and said in his best tough guy voice, What are you talking about, sailor? I picked my cat card up off the bar and put it in front of his face. Uh, you meant to say soldier, didn't you, elite United States Navy SEAL? As in, Sergeant First Class. As in, Gunnery Sergeant. You should know that, what with you being an elite United States Navy SEAL and all. Well, the college girl from Nebraska looked at her two Navy SEAL heroes, confusion etched on her face. My girlfriend picked up her cat card. I'm the sailor gentleman, petty officer third class, surface warfare sonar technician. Now, where are your cat guards? A sweetly wicked smile never left her face. Well, by now there was a noticeable hush on the deck as several of the patrons had quieted down to witness the spectacle unfolding at the bar. I glanced over at a nearby table underneath a palm tree, illuminated by the warm glow of the table's fire pit, where four shorts, Casually dressed muscular dudes with massive tree trunks for thighs were quietly sipping Corona lights and intently staring at us. I slipped them a quick wink, knowing that it was time to swiftly end this charade. 
Oh, come on, gentlemen, I said. You know that if we challenge you to show your cat cards, and you have them, we have to buy you your drinks for the rest of the night. But if we challenge you to show your cat cards and you don't have them, my girlfriend said, smiling as she took a sip of champagne. Well, go ahead and show them, said the college girl. Free drinks for the rest of the night. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, my girlfriend and I said at the same time. But we, but we don't, said UVA sweater guy. We're elite United States Navy SEALs, said button-down shirt guy. We don't need cork cards. Cack, I said. Yeah, we don't need cack cards, repeated button-down shirt guy, annoyed. Elite United States Navy SEALs like us are too special forces to have cack cards. Yeah, cack cards are for, for... Yeah, for people who aren't as special forces as us, elite United States Navy SEALs, chimed in UVA sweater guy. Then, knowing that the gig was up, UVA sweater guy turned and said, Come on, Steve, putting a shaky arm around button-down shirt guy and dragging him away. Yeah, these people obviously don't know anything about what it's like being an elite United States Navy SEAL. Uh, yeah, said button-down shirt guy as he allowed UVA sweater guy to lead him away down the wooden steps of the deck and towards the beach. Yeah, they don't know what it's like. He looked over his shoulder and stuck out his middle finger at us. Yeah, see you around, you ugly Nebraska corn-fed slut. Taking a sip from my champagne glass, I raised a toast to the two rapidly retreating fakers and said, <laughs> Happy New Year's. I looked towards the table where the short, muscular dudes were sitting in. As I expected, found it empty. The four quiet muscular dudes were probably following UVA sweater guy and button-down shirt guy down to the beach so that they could discuss elite United States Navy SEAL stuff with them. And the patrons of Catch-31 turned their attention away from us and quickly returned to their holiday celebrations and festivities. A lot of real military warriors live in Virginia Beach, and it was pretty commonplace to see stolen Valor heroes get their asses handed to them by the actual heroes that they were trying to portray. I turned and looked at the little co-ed from Nebraska. Her eyes were wide and her mouth hung open. My girlfriend caught the co-ed's glass of Long Island iced tea before she accidentally dropped it on the wooden deck. My girlfriend took a quick sip of the potent drink before placing the tall glass on the bar. Whoa, that's good stuff, she said, nodding approvingly. I gently put my hand on the college girl's shoulder and smiled. Don't listen to those jerks, I said. Look, there are only about 2,000 SEALs serving in the Navy. Virginia Beach is a great place to visit and a pretty safe place to party. But be careful. You just need to watch out for her. My girlfriend leaned on my shoulder, a huge smile on her face. You just need to watch out for the 8,000 fake-ass elite United States Navy SEAL wannabes prowling around the boardwalk looking for innocent college girls from Nebraska to take advantage of. My girlfriend waved at the girl as she was talking and held out her hand. My name's Ellie. What's yours? Oh, I'm Andrea, she said, shaking my girlfriend's hand. I'm Fox, I said, shaking Andrea's hand. First time visiting Virginia Beach? Oh, this is my first time ever leaving Nebraska, Andrea answered. Well, Andrea, said Ellie, still smiling as she wrapped her arms around my shoulders, if you really want to find a Navy SEAL, then look for a really quiet guy with broad shoulders and legs the size of oak trees, who claims he's just a lowly Navy cook who's never been in combat, but yet drives around in a big, badass truck with tires the size of a mammoth. That's a Navy SEAL. Silent. Strong. Deadly and uber, uber sexy. Hey, I said, pretending to be offended as Ellie chuckled and kissed my cheek. Andrea laughed. Well, I'm just here visiting my sister for the holiday. She married a sailor and they were stationed here. She said that I need to get out in Nebraska and explore and not be so introverted. Oh, I'm not looking for a Navy SEAL in particular, but maybe you just want to meet a good man. Oh, the ratio of women to men out in Lincoln is about five to three. Well, Andrea, I said, this is the place. The ratio of men to women here in Tidewater area is about ten to one. Yeah, said Ellie. Lucky you, Fox. Of all the guys I could have picked. Well, the absolute very best of them all picked you, 
I interrupted, and we all had a good laugh. The maitre d' of Catch-31 approached us and said, uh, Mr. Fox, your table is ready and waiting for you. He looked at Andrea. Will the young lady be joining your party tonight? Andrea blushed. Uh, no, I'm fine. I'll be fine. Are you sure? asked Ellie. Both Ellie and Andrea looked to be about the same age, around 22, although Ellie was a good head, taller than Andrea. Ellie was always attracted to older military men who outranked her. I was always attracted to crazy young blonde German girls who were taller than me. I was 15 years older than Ellie and outranked her by four stripes, while Ellie was blonde, taller than me by two inches, five if you count her in heels, and was of German descent, so we immediately hit it off when I first met her at the Starbucks in the mall. Ellie and I had always had a blast when our deployment schedules allowed us to be together, and the fact that I was Army and she was Navy meant there were no conflicts of interest between our different service branches and chains of command. I also understood that Ellie would want someone closer to her age to talk with, so I didn't mind when she invited Andrea to sit with us. Still, Andrea insisted that she would be fine, and that she would take our advice about meeting guys here in Virginia Beach. Remember, said Ellie as we waved goodbye, there are ten guys to every one girl here at the beach. Try not to break too many hearts. I'll try, laughed Andrea. However, Ellie and I had no sooner turned around to walk to our table when I heard some guy walk up to Andrea and say, So, baby, you ever hear of the elite United States Navy SEALs? Oh, I'm the most elite of them all, because you'll never guess who I killed. I was about to turn around when Ellie tightened her grip on my arm and said, Eddie is killer. The maitre d' led us inside the restaurant and through a large, crowded, brightly lit, circular-shaped room which contained another circular bar in the middle of the restaurant. The bar was surrounded by cosy tables and couples enjoying courses of fresh seafood and other delicious menu items. The buzz of conversation intermingled with the clinking toast of glasses and the smells of sumptuous foods which made my stomach rumble and my mouth water. Next to the large bay windows, a pianist was playing a slow, jazzy tune on an ebony grand piano as we followed the maitre d' through another set of double doors and down a short corridor into another section of the restaurant which consisted of a long room where the lighting was dimmed to create a more romantic, ambient setting. Our table was set with two tall, glowing candles, a basket with a selection of warm, fresh breads and rocks, two glasses of ice water and a bottle of champagne waiting for us. Our table was beside a wide, tinted bay window, which gave us a slightly elevated and unrestricted view of the bustling boardwalk and beachfront. It was much quieter here in this section of the restaurant, and the tables along the room were spaced further apart to give each couple a greater modicum of privacy to enjoy each other's company in relative peace and quiet. As we waited for our food to arrive, we talked about the things which were going on in our lives. Ellie talking about US Navy stuff, half of which went completely over my head, and I was talking about army stuff, half of which I'm sure went completely over her head. I talked about fighting terrorists in Iraq and Afghanistan, and Ellie talked about our US Navy terrorist busting cruises to places such as the Bahamas, Rota in Spain, Morocco, and Nice in France, while she was serving aboard the Ali Burke-class destroyer named after a US Marine colonel who'd earned the Medal of Honor. Good Lord, honey, I laughed. You Navy guys bust terrorists where most of us normal people go to vacation. She grabbed up some ice out of the champagne bucket and playfully tossed it at me. Oh yeah? Well, where were you when those two punk-ass college jerks were out there killing Osama bin Laden? Mister, I'm a big badass army cavalry scout. I grinned and raised an eyebrow, whispering. I was making your toes curl, remember? Well, Ellie smiled and bit on her index finger. Oh yeah she said, licking the corner of her lips. Anyway, she said, changing the topic, what if the zombie apocalypse has already happened? Huh? I said. No, no, hear me out, continued Ellie. What if the zombie apocalypse has already happened, and we're all just shambling, rotting corpses, but we don't realize it? What if, in what's left of our dead and decaying brains, we think we're still living our lives, going to work? celebrating New Year and eating dinner. But in reality, we're all chomping down in the live and screaming body of some living person who we'd hauled from the ground. I looked down at my dinner plate. Honey, this medium-rare Kobe beef costs $135. 
I like to enjoy it without thinking in reality it's some person's entrails or something. Ellie scooped a forkful of her slow-cooked prime rib into her mouth. Ooh, that really is tender. You should try this. No thanks, I said. Might be someone I know. Oh, come on, honey, Ellie exclaimed. That would make a great story. Ellie, I said. I'm not submitting any of my stories to your creepy doctor friend. Besides, my stories are based off of actual paranormal events that had happened. I wouldn't even know where to begin a fictional story from scratch. Oh, N, creepen, said Ellie, emphasizing the N in creep. Ah, whatever, I said. What's wrong with me just reading you my stories? Why do you need your creepy doctor to read my stories to you? Creepen, Ellie said again, grabbing more ice out of the bucket. And besides, his voice is silky and sexy. You always sound like you're yelling at boot camp recruits. I crossed my arms, pretending to be offended. Your mom's voice is silky and sexy, I said, just before I was hit by a handful of champagne bucket ice. She's also only two years older than you, you cradle-robbing jerk, Ellie said playfully, a chunk of prime rib clutched in her teeth. At that moment, the dark purple skies above the beach exploded with bright, flashing sparkles of red, yellow, and orange fireworks. We sat silently, ooh, and ah, as an endless boom of vibrant, colorful lights burst forth and danced in the air before they slowly descended towards the ground. Outside, we could hear the muffled sounds of crowds cheering and celebrating at each colourful explosion of fireworks. But in the back of my mind, I imagined that, in an alternate reality, the sounds could easily be the horrified screams of panicking people being drowned out by the hungry moans of hordes of the undead. Well, I hated to admit it, but any suggestion about undead zombies not realising they're undead zombies would make a pretty cool scary story, or scary spaghetti story, or whatever the heck type of story Ellie called them. I looked over at my girlfriend, the bright burst of the New Year light show being reflected in her US Navy issue of eyeglasses. Clinking a champagne glass with me, I said, Happy New Year, Ellie. Happy New Year, Fox, she answered with the most genuine and loving smile I'd ever seen. But behind the sultry look which she gave me, I could also tell that she wasn't done with trying to get me to send my stories to her creepy doctor friend, whose smooth and relaxing voice she would often listen to on YouTube during the long hour she spent alone at night when the Navy had her on watch duty. Later that evening, in the room on the fifth floor, we'd gotten at the hotel attached to the Catch-31 restaurant. Ellie and I created our own fireworks to celebrate the new year, as our passion made us one, her dainty little toes curling often as my back was set ablaze with her scratches. The large sliding bay window leading out to the balcony was open, and the sound of the sea crashing ashore seemed to match the rhythm of our bodies coming together. Later, as a cool and gentle breeze washed over us, we lay in the glow of our passion and exhaustion. Ellie was lying on her side facing me, drawing circles with her finger on the sheen of sweat on my chest. She kissed the side of my cheek. Do you know what I want to do now? She whispered huskily into my ear. Jacuzzi, I said. Damn straight, Jacuzzi, Ellie said, suddenly jumping up and grabbing a towel and the second champagne bottle sitting in a bucket of melting ice. Oh, I've been wanting to try that thing all night. The Jacuzzi was actually located outside on the spacious balcony which allowed guests to relax in the warm, jet-driven waters while enjoying the scenery of the beach view below. Ellie barely had the towel around her nakedness and I once again admired her lithe and athletic body as she disappeared outside to get the jacuzzi going. Soon I could hear the water beginning to flow into the jacuzzi as Ellie yelled, Hey, hurry up gunnery sergeant Grandpa. Grandpa, I yelled back, rolling out of bed and wrapping a towel around me. Woman, I've deployed more. <laughs> I've deployed more, repeated Ellie, imitating me in a mocking tone. I've defended more, I've attacked more, I've patrolled more, I've fought more, I've kissed more officer bud. Heck, I've even met Bigfoot. Blah, 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 blah. Are you coming or not? Silhouetted by the moonlight, I could just see Ellie climbing into the jacuzzi. Smart ass, I said. Instead of going directly outside, I headed into the bathroom and took a quick cold shower to rinse away all the sweat which I'd worked up earlier. 
despite the cool winter breeze flowing into the room from outside. I got out and toweled off before stepping naked outside onto the balcony. The boardwalk below us was still brightly lit as I stared down at the tall and majestic statue of King Neptune, which stood and reigned from his own special pedestal on the boardwalk to the left of the hotel. Most of the partiers and revelers had already gone home, but there were still more than a few folks walking around getting in that last drink of the new year, or trying to make that last attempt to attract that special friend for the evening. Ellie scooted over and poured some ice-cold champagne into a glass for me as I climbed into the jacuzzi. The jets churned the hot water around us in massaging waves as steam rose into the cool night air. I tried to ignore the sharp pain in my back from where the hot water splashed over the scratches Ellie had left as I put my arm around her and held her close. We toasted again and took a sip of champagne. Then Ellie snuggled up against me. For a while we just relaxed in silence, watching the dark clouds dance in front of a bright winter moon as the soft hum of the jacuzzi washed caressing waves of hot water over us. I could feel my eyes getting heavy and I happily contemplated drifting off to sleep in this idyllic setting. So, Ellie suddenly exclaimed with a splash of water that brought me back to full wakefulness and sobriety. She set her glass aside. Oh, I thought, here it comes. Creepy doctor, right? I said. Why not? Ellie persisted. Oh, come on, Fox, your stories are good. I mean, I mean, why wouldn't you want them to be read? I shrugged my shoulders. I don't know. I really just wrote them for myself so that I wouldn't forget the event. I guess, well, uh, I don't know. Yeah, but that stuff happened right, said Ellie. I mean, those stories are true, right? You've actually experienced that weird stuff. I mean, I'm not the only one who... She stopped suddenly. I set my glass down and looked Ellie in the face. Her long, light blonde hair clung close to her framing the face of the most beautiful girl I'd ever dated against the bright moonlight. Ellie had never been one to be short of words. However, here she was now, breathing hard and struggling to find the words to say what was on her mind. Sweetheart, did something happen to you? Did you experience something? I asked. You... You promise you won't think I'm nuts? replied Ellie. Hey, I said. I made Italian soldiers chase a ghost in Zerkov Valley in Afghanistan. I got chased by Bigfoot while training to be a cavalry scout in Pennsylvania, and, oh, oh yeah, my cousin's artillery unit blew away some mythical Batwoman monster in the Philippines, so, um... Ellie pushed me down into the water playfully. So you better not think I'm nuts, mister, because I'll leave you and not look back, because there are ten guys to every smoking hot chick like me around here. Blah, 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 I replied. Are you going to tell me what happened to you? Or are you going to keep telling me some fantasy story about some mythical guy from around here who could put up with your crazy ass? Damn it, said Ellie. Where's a handful of ice when you need it? Ellie's expression suddenly turned serious as she sat up. She turned to look at me and sighed deeply. After a second, she said, Do you remember my last night on shore duty? I returned her gaze with an inquisitive look. Yeah, I answered. It was a couple of weeks ago, wasn't it? The Navy assigned you to be part of the small Navy presence aboard the battleship USS Wisconsin. I thought back on what I knew of the battleship USS Wisconsin. It was one of four Iowa-class battleships designed and built during World War II in order to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the gigantic Imperial Japanese Navy battleships which the Japanese had put to sea, such as the mighty battleship Yamato. The Wisconsin displaced 58,000 tons fully loaded, had a length of just under 890 feet, and had a crew complement of almost 2,000 officers and enlisted sailors. She joined the USS Pacific Fleet in 1944 and mounted three massive gun turrets, two fore and one aft, each turret housing three mighty 16-inch guns which could fire a 2,700-pound high-explosive shell in excess of 20 miles. She was also outfitted with 25-inch guns and had an additional 80 40mm and 50 20mm guns for close-in defence. Though the Wisconsin did not participate in any battleship-versus-battleship engagements, 
She did take part in many fire support operations against Japanese targets in the waning months of World War II. After the war, in 1948, the mighty battleship was decommissioned and placed in reserve status. However, this was to be short-lived, as the Wisconsin was again recalled to duty, this time to aid in the fighting against the communist North Koreans and Chinese during the Korean War. It was during this time when the Wisconsin joined the naval gun line of warships which poured heavy, high explosive shells on the enemy shore positions almost on a daily basis. The Wisconsin served until 1958, when she was again decommissioned and kept in reserve status for nearly 20 years before, in 1988, the United States called up the aging warrior to join the fleet once again. This time the USS Wisconsin was modernized to fight a new and more powerful enemy. All but 12 of her 5-inch guns were replaced by batteries of Tomahawk and Harpoon missiles, and her 20mm and 40mm guns were replaced by more effective, computer-guided 20mm phalanx weapon systems. In 1991, the USS Wisconsin answered the call to deploy to the Persian Gulf as part of Operation Desert Storm, and together with her sister battleship, the USS Missouri, rained high-explosive hell on Iraqi Army fortified armoured units and sank over a dozen Iraqi naval ships with her 16-inch guns. The Wisconsin's guns finally fell silent after the war, and in September 1991, she was assigned to the reserve fleet where she sat silently for nearly a decade. Then, on December the 7th, 2000, the anniversary of the Japanese sneak attack on Pearl Harbor, the Wisconsin was towed down the Elizabeth River and berthed next to the National Maritime Museum, Nauticus, in the heart of downtown Norfolk, Virginia, where she rests to this day, serving as a museum ship that welcomes tens of thousands of tourists from around the world every year. A very small presence of Navy personnel have rotated through the Nauticus to act as goodwill ambassadors to the many civilian visitors and retired sailors who once served aboard the Wisconsin, tour guides and liaisons for Navy-sponsored special events which often occur on her proud deck. But perhaps the most important task for the small cadre of sailors attached to the Wisconsin is to act as watchstanders for the ship. The USS Wisconsin was not completely out of the fleet. She was simply put into mothball status, and as such, by proclamation of Congress, the Wisconsin was not to be altered in any way that would hinder her from returning to combat. The ship must be maintained and preserved using cathodic protection to prevent metal corrosion dehumidification systems to protect wiring and electrical systems, and areas of the ship which were still considered sensitive and not open to the public were to be secured. This usually required one sailor to stay alone aboard the ship until midnight, acting as a sort of security guard, checking to ensure hatches are closed, sensitive areas are sealed off, dehumidification systems are functioning correctly, and making sure there are no stowaways looking for a place to sleep for the night. Ellie usually drew this duty once or twice a week, and actually she quite enjoyed it, as it allowed her to pull up her favourite creepy doctor on her cell phone, get a favourite Dr Pepper drink, and listen to the lady's spooky tale of horror being read to her in a smooth tone of voice, which actually made me quite jealous. Well, I didn't have a voice that didn't sound like I was constantly yelling at boot camp recruits. But the last night that she had shore duty was different. Ellie came home at around two in the morning, a full hour later than she usually arrived home. She was sweating, even though it was mid-December. She was nervous and shaking, and she smelled of alcohol. The cheap stuff, I could tell. Her usually well-pressed uniform was disheveled. And instead of sitting and talking a while, as we usually did when she came home from watch duty, she walked past the living room and into the kitchen, where she poured herself two or three shots of brandy into a tumbler, gulped it down with shaking hands, and then went to bed. She never once looked at me or spoke to me. Now, Ellie had always been open and honest with me about everything she did. After all, we were both career military. Well, things happen. Ellie admitted to me before that, on her last six-month terrorist-busting cruise aboard her destroyer, she'd had affairs with three of her senior chiefs, two of whom were married. Like me, they were all older than her, and outranked her, just the way she liked them. I imagined that tonight she probably had a sexual encounter with one of her senior chiefs, 
probably in the magazine room beside one of those gun turrets mounted on the Wisconsin. I didn't bring the subject up the next morning as I got ready for duty, as I knew Ellie would tell me what happened when she felt the time was right. Instead, however, the next day, Ellie began to get on her kick of bugging me to submit my military supernatural stories to her creepy doctor friend. Well, actually I was assigned to the Nordicus Naval Museum next to where the USS Wisconsin is birthed. No one's assigned to the Wisconsin, said Ellie. Oh, and it's N. Creepen. What are you talking about? I said. As if I didn't know what you were just thinking, Fox, she answered. You move your lips when you're in deep thought. <sighs> okay, I said. What happened to you aboard the Wisconsin that night? I was fully expecting to hear a torrid story of how her and some married senior chief had... The USS Wisconsin went to battle stations, said Ellie. Oh, I knew it, I said. Wait, what? You didn't have some hot passionate affair with some senior ranking guy in the gun magazine turret? What? said Ellie, pulling away from me and sitting up. Hot water and steam flying everywhere. <laughs> no! Because I'd totally cheat on you with some hot chick if I could do it in the gun turret of a battleship, I continued. Fox, she said, leaning close and pointing a finger in my face. I swear I'm going to throw your stupid army ass off this balcony and shoot you as you fall with my 9mm just because, well... <laughs> I reached forward and wrapped my arms around her and she reluctantly let me pull her close. She was breathing hard and her heart was pounding in her chest. I'm sorry, honey, I whispered. You better be, you jerk, she replied. You think I'd wait until my last night on shore duty to cheat on you with some other hot senior chief? Oof, touche, I said. Anyway, you said that the uh, Wisconsin went to battle stations. Yes, she answered. You mean with the klaxons blaring and the whistles blowing and the horns sounding and... Whatever the heck else happens when you Navy guys get ready to make really loud, booming noises. Yeah, something like that, Ali said. Well, the Wisconsin going to battle stations would have been my second guess if the first one wasn't that you were cheating on me, I said. Where were you? Ellie rolled over and sat back down in the bubbling jacuzzi. The cold air had chilled her upper body and she sank into the steaming water up to her chin. I was below, down about two decks, checking on the dehumidifier operating gauges. It was near midnight when the generator-driven lights suddenly dimmed and the red warning lights over the P-ways began to flash and blare. Then this voice came over the intercom ordering everyone to get to their duty stations and prepare their sections for the ship firing. Honey, I said, um, I'm not too familiar with naval lingo and ship gunnery firing procedures, so. Can you dumb it down for me, uh, infantry style? If I dumbed it down any more, said Ellie, I'd have to draw stick figures for you in crayon. But the bottom line is, when a ship like the Wisconsin fires a broadside, one side of the ship would literally lift out of the water from the recoil of all those heavy caliber guns firing at once. Ellie's knees were pulled into her chest and she hugged them with her arms. She was staring off into space. I could hear sailors yelling, others giving orders, and the sound of running steps pounding up and down the P-ways. I couldn't see anyone directly, but out of the corner of my eye I could see dozens of sailors running to their stations. Oh, I felt tossed around as if people were bumping into me on that P-way as they ran past. Also, it wasn't cold anymore. It was hot and humid, sort of like a stifling tropical humid, and it smelled of sweat, oil, stale air and seas. Well, I didn't know what to do, Fox. So I just shut my eyes and put my hands over my ears to drown out the noise of that blaring horn. I just crouched down in the corner of that peeway next to a hatch, which should have been closed, but was now wide open. Well, then I heard this voice in front of me saying, What are you doing down there, shipmate? Are you hurt? Why are you in your dress white instead of your dungarees? I looked up to see two sailors looking down at me, Confused expressions on their faces. They were real. I mean, they were solid, real human beings, not spectral forms. And then one of them said, 
Golly, it's a girl. What are you doing here? Well, I stood up straight and ran forward. I ran forward right through the bodies of the two sailors standing there, and I crossed the open hatch. I knew this ship like the back of my hand, but I was suddenly lost in the maze of narrow corridors and peeways. I turned a corner and pressed my back against the bulkhead, trying to catch my breath. Around the corner I heard the two sailors running after me. One of them said, Where did she go? And the other one answered, She just vanished. Well, maybe she's a ghost. And his partner said, How can she have been a ghost? Oh, the Navy would never let females serve aboard combat warships. I was just around the corner, on my knees and crying. All of a sudden the entire ship exploded with a loud boom. It sounded like a million lightning strikes hitting all at once. The starboard part of the ship actually lifted up and we rocked to port. I was thrown off balance as I just realized that the Wisconsin had fired an entire broadside of all nine of her 16-inch guns right in the middle of downtown Norfolk. Well, I got up and began to run to the nearest steps, which would lead to the upper deck of the ship. The Wisconsin rocked again with the sound of her secondary weapons, or five-inch guns, as she continued to fire into the city. Ellie hung her head, her wet blonde hair falling in front of her face. Wisconsin fired her main batteries of 16-inch guns again and the ship rocked violently. I kept losing my balance. My ears were ringing from the concussive explosions of the guns. I could smell the smoke and cordite in the air. All of a sudden, I started to get visions of our statues and monuments being torn down, stores and buildings being destroyed, and our city on fire as people ran and yelled. It was as if the USS Wisconsin was putting these images of violence and destruction into my head. I attempted to embrace her, but she pulled away. I was utterly exhausted when I finally opened the hatch to the quarterdeck and which, well, led outside, and I expected to see fires and destruction, the city in flames, and people screaming and dying, but, well, I saw nothing. The night was quiet and serene. I was drenched in sweat, but the cool breeze which met me when I opened the hatch made me freeze. The moon was bright, just like it is tonight. I ran to the edge of the ship and looked over the railing and saw the tranquil scene of a few people taking peaceful strolls along the sidewalk at Town Point Park next to the river. The waterside was still open and a few people were still having drinks at the bars. So, that's why you smell like a brewery when you came home that night, I said. You're a genius, said Ellie. You figured that out all by yourself. Yeah, I uh, needed a few drinks just to calm my nerves so that I could drive home. Hmm. Hang on a second, honey, I said as I grabbed my smartphone. Let me see something. I pulled up a website of combat operations of the USS Wisconsin. Hmm. Your last night of shore duty at the Nordicus was 20th of December, the night that the Wisconsin went to battle stations. Hmm. Let's see. Oh, here we go. It says here that on the 20th of December... 1951, off the Korean shoreline, the USS Wisconsin participated in a coordinated air surface bombardment of Wonsan to neutralize pre-selected communist targets in support of Allied forces ground operations. The Wisconsin destroyed several communist watercraft in Wonsan Harbor with her five-inch guns before she shifted fire to rain tons of high explosive on a communist counterattack, forcing the enemy to abandon their assault. Ellie finally leaned in close to me again. So you believe me? You don't think I'm crazy? <laughs> You're crazy, I said. But I believe you. I looked down at Ellie, who was making herself comfortable cuddling next to me as the steaming jets of water continued to roll over us. What do you think it all means? Well, Ellie pursed her lips, contemplating. Well, I've been thinking about that. They say that the spirits and sense of duty and commitment of those who'd served aboard them still inhabit our capital ships. The Wisconsin served America in times of crisis. She'd then go to sleep when she wasn't needed, only to wake again when America was in danger. Well, maybe the USS Wisconsin is awakening again. Maybe there's some danger coming to America in the future. <laughs> I don't know. I sat up, scooting over slightly so I was sitting cross-legged facing Ellie. 
and gently slid a strand of her blonde hair away from her face, then took her hands into mine. Honey, it's a new year. Our monuments and statues aren't being torn down. Our stores and buildings aren't being destroyed. Our cities aren't on fire. And people sure as hell aren't yelling in the streets. I smiled reassuringly. Trust me, Ellie. 2020 is going to be a great year. Promise, she said. I promise, I answered. And we kissed well into the night. Well, what on earth do you think of that one? Well, I was in it, wasn't I? One of the main characters, I'd like to think. <laughs> it was kind of weird reading a story in which I was one of the characters in a story that I was reading. Um, blah, 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 blah. don't know what the hell that means, but you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Well, really enjoyed that one. Um, well, poof. Um, I've got a few really, really long stories coming up on the uh, sort of two to three hour bracket. And I'm going to be asking you which one you want me to read first. They're all kind of ongoing. I've started recording them, but they are, well, marathon shifts to putting in to get them all done. So um, I'm going to ask you which one you want first. But they're all coming along, you know, sooner or later. Well, what am I talking about? Enough for one night. Enough, enough, enough. My dear friends, I will be back again with you very, very soon. But until the next time, sweet dreams and bye-bye. And remember... 2020 is going to be a great year for all of us. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.